So I wanted to make this video after I did a little research. I wanted to do a little more analyzing of not just the event, but the church in which it's being held at. I've watched four different testimonies of current and graduate students of the university who attended the quote unquote revival. Okay. And their testimonies brought to light exactly what I figured was going on. Listen, this whole event is nothing more than strange fire. Okay? One thing I'm good at is listening very closely to what people say when they're recounting an experience. And, and in one of the students' testimony, he recounts going into a fit of laughter with his friend during the revival. He claims that he just couldn't control his laughter and attributes it to the Holy Spirit. Another student who attended with his mother claims that his mom began speaking in tongues, unknown tongues. And people were catching the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And a lot of this took place outside of the church. I also found out that the university ordains women for ministry. OK, so there's a lot wrong here. Now, aside from all that, I took the time out to watch the live stream that's still going on right now. And I was just waiting. Okay, I was waiting for a man of God to take the pulpit, open the Bible and to preach the word of God. And it never happened. OK, have you ever heard this saying before? The goats feast while the sheep starve. Okay, the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel reveals that Satan may have been involved with music while he was in heaven. And one of the ways Satan gets people to believe that they are experiencing something of God is through music that permeates emotion. OK, I know I know this personally speaking, because when I was first converted, I joined a Pentecostal church here in Milwaukee, a very popular church uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And I remember they would place the same melody or the same song over and over again on repeat. And people would get up and dance. Some people would literally run around the aisles. People would be catching the Holy Ghost and it was just a bunch of nonsense. And I remember specifically how it made me feel as an immature Christian. I remember feeling really emotional, almost on the verge of tears because it felt like God was moving, but he wasn't. I was just caught up in the experience. And in my immaturity, I attributed it to a move of God. Okay, That's what I truly believed at that point in my life, that it was, that this was God moving. Okay? I was a part of something big. But you know what began happening week after week? Each week, it got harder and harder to partake in the experience at that church. And why was that? Because each week I was going home and I was devouring the word of God. I was scouring YouTube for biblical sermons and was seeking out biblical teachers. And I was maturing very fast. And then after about four months, I remember looking at my girlfriend during one of the services. And I just said, I said, we got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I can't, I can't take it anymore. We need to leave. I was starving. Okay. Enough with the circus. Will somebody get up there and preach the word of God? The goats were feasting, but I was starving. Okay. I, I want to take you guys back to like, 2013, I remember on my first YouTube channel, I used to take old Paul Washer clips and I would cut them up, cut up the best parts and I would upload them. And this was way back when nobody was watching the content on Heart Cry Missionary channel. I mean, like each video had like 300, 300 views. It was just dead. OK, but I was watching them and I'll never forget this old sermon Paul preached somewhere in the UK. It was at a really old church and true revival actually broke out during his sermon. I mean, you could hear people groaning and weeping and people were coming in from outside and sitting on the floor. People had their hands lifted, not for some songs or music, but for the preaching. And I remember even Paul recognized while he was preaching that something unusual was happening. And, and, and at the time, I didn't even know what revival was. I didn't even know what the word revival meant, but I knew something was different about this service. The people there were being moved, okay, not by the music, but by the gospel truth that was coming out of Paul's mouth. And I'm 100% certain that people were saved at that sermon, at that, uh, that, that service. And I'm sure that before Paul preached that sermon, they sang glorious songs. I'm sure that they sang songs. OK, uh, I'm not against worship music. All I'm saying is that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Listen, I was really hoping that this thing was real, okay? that this quote unquote revival was real. But from what I've seen and from what I've heard, I just don't have the confidence to say that it was of God. We, we hear much talk about the gospel. In some ways, the gospel has become a fad. And unfortunately, when something becomes a fad, there are those who jump on the bandwagon and have absolutely no idea why what it is that they are lauding is significant. Nor in some cases, what it is that is so significant. So there are those who speak much about the gospel, but when they say gospel, they don't mean what the Bible means 
by gospel. There are some who are excited about hearing so much gospel talk because to them, the gospel is the means by which God levels the socioeconomic playing field in the world. And so when they say gospel and when they celebrate gospel, what they are celebrating is a social gospel. There are others, and when they hear gospel, they're excited about that because for them, the gospel is all the moral teachings of Jesus. And so they celebrate a form of legalism. There are others who are more subtle in their form of legalism. Because when they hear gospel, they simplified the gospel. And there's a, there's a phrase, there's a mantra that is going around now that is presumed to be a simplification of the gospel. And it is love God, love people. The irony here could not be greater. Love God, love people is actually an abbreviation of Jesus' teaching on the greatest commandments. Here's the great irony. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And it was a legitimate question. There were legitimate arguments, and some would have argued that the first commandment was the greatest commandment, and that all the others rested on the first commandment. Some would have argued that the fifth commandment was the greatest because it was the bridge between the first and second tables of the law. Others would have argued that the tenth commandment and coveting was the greatest commandment because ultimately all of your sin arises out of your coveting. So Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Is he going to say one? Is he going to say five? Is he going to say ten? And Jesus looks at them and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Which, by the way, is a summary of the first table of the law. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? I'm going to have to say one through four. And then the other shoe drops. He says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, which is a summary of the second table of the law. So here's how the conversation went. Jesus, which commandment is the greatest commandment? His response, I'm going to have to say one through four, followed closely by five through ten. <laughs> Folks, this ubiquitous saying, love God, love people, is actually a summary of the law. The whole law. It's not the gospel at all. It's what the gospel freed us from and to. Amen? Amen. So when we talk about gospel, we need to be clear. 